Welcome to Cast of Creators. We're your hosts. I'm Nelson Thal. And I'm Casey Stewart. We spent our careers in media and publishing, and now we're setting the stage for creative people who inspire us to share their stories. Today, we chat with Elaine Fancy, also known as E Fancy. And yes, Fancy is really her last name. E. Fancy is a commercial lifestyle photographer who's worked with Gordon Ramsay, American Express, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, Cirque du Soleil, and many more. We dive into the wisdom she's gained throughout her career. We talk about moving to the U.S. on a soccer scholarship, and we chat a little bit about getting paid on time as a freelancer. Very important. Let's get started. Fancy? Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. So glad you're here. (laughs) Yeah, I'm excited. It's wonderful to have you here. When I was putting up the lights and thinking about the lighting here and the cameras, (laughs) you were someone (laughs) on my mind. And I was really excited for you to see the space and really get the fancy uh, you know, seal of, of approval. approval. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that when it came in, we already tweaked a little bit of a change. I, I don't know what it looks like right now, but I'm sure it's perfect. Yeah, yeah it's great. Good. I think my my light was a little high. A little high, so we brought it <laughs> We brought down. it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine that you're, I mean, so I know a bit of a, a bit about photography. Okay. And um, there's a lot of things that you can correct, but overexposure isn't necessarily one of them. One of the hardest ones, yeah. And um, I'm sure, you know, as a phenomenal photographer. Oh, thank you. Um, you're constantly riding that edge of obviously like thinking about this has got to look good for the client. This has got to look good mm. for the client. Yeah. And um and so like here, like I know that as we record, um, if stuff's overexposed, I'm like caught. Like that's yeah. basically <laughs> like like my worst. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously. And, and, and this is, is same with you, like even with your hard drives, like my worst fear is like I get to the end of this thing. I press I press stop. Yeah. And I've got like nothing. You know what I mean? <laughs> or or like I've got overexposed video yeah. or I don't have I, I check my hard drive and the files haven't come out. right. Oh, yeah. It's a dance. Yeah. And you're doing that dance every day. I am. And I've gotten caught in it at least <laughs> once. Um, but luckily for me, it was one of my really close friends. So I was shooting. And then when I got home to download the images, the um, the CF card had corrupt. And I didn't understand why. And I did all the research I could to pull it back. I even went to the point of finding a guy in Germany. And right. I'd ship it to him and he'd take the body apart. And I was watching his YouTubes. He's like soldering <laughs> like the chip apart and then like dipping it in acid so he can get the mini microchip and try and remove the files. And I was like, Sergio, listen. I'm really sorry, but we got to reshoot. Yeah. I'll wow. pay for it, but we got to reshoot. But luckily for me, it was like a one hour thing. Yeah. It was totally understandable. I've been supporting his business for years since he opened and we've been vice versa. So it was one of those things like no fuss. Let's yeah. get the model yeah. back in nice. for an hour. Let's just get it done. But learned my lesson since that day. I've completely converted to SD cards on my camera. Yeah. And also reading a little bit about CF cards. It says that like it has a lifespan. Right. Similar to your batteries, similar to your camera. After like it's just been overused, it just dies. So I just got rid of all of my CF cards the next day and ordered a bunch of SD cards. And now I'm on a different system, but same camera, same job. Well, it's a tricky system either way yeah. in the sense that, um, for example, I'm purposely recording this mm-hmm. in two locations as we speak. Oh, double backup guy. Double backup yeah. guy. <laughs> okay. Paranoid kind of guy. Paranoid. <laughs> but the thing is, one of the locations isn't as good as the other, and one of the locations is getting a lesser quality outcome than the other, in okay. the sense that I'm only recording the isolated cameras in one location. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, at some point when you finish an event, that event exists on that one card yeah, yeah, yeah. at that moment. Yeah. And I can almost feel what that feels like. Okay. Yeah. And it's a feeling like if you're, <laughs> if you're in it, it's a feeling. It's yeah. not like, you know, okay, it's on the card. No, uh, it's like, yeah. you can feel it in your gut. Yeah. So, um, I mean, your process is like, you must scamper out of that event. Keep that card pretty safe. Get it home. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, um, you're not like going out for dinner or drinks, taking the card in the camera. You know, some days it's questionable. <laughs> if I've had a 12 hour day and I've ran out of memory on a camera, on a card, I'm like, paranoid to it's kind of like your passport yeah you know when you have your passport yeah. in your bag and you're on the way to the airport and you keep digging in to check it yes. like i know it's i know it's there yes. you know it's I do that all, it can't I do be that there the like whole i airport. definitely forgot it 
So for the same thing for me is I used to just finish a card, put it in the case and put it in my bag. Mm -hmm. And then I became so paranoid that like, what if someone steals my bag? What if that card goes missing? So I started putting it in my pants. Right. <laughs> so I started putting memory cards in my jeans. And then after a 12 hour day, if I didn't check my jeans and my jeans went in the laundry basket, oh, no. half of that event was in the laundry basket. Right. So that's like something we wouldn't typically tell a client. <clears throat> no, exactly. But I've never failed. I've always checked my pockets before the laundry. So I've been lucky. But there's, it's the same thing, like an S, uh, like a CF card, for instance. Your and camera. what is a CF card versus Compact an SD flash. card? Okay. okay. Just checking because so, I didn't know. Yeah, I don't yeah. know CF either. So for <laughs> DSLR cameras, for professional cameras, there's a CF card, which is compact flash. It's just made with like aluminum. It's more steady, sturdy, more compact. But like an SD card is like floppy plastic. Yeah. So mm -hmm. a CF is just heavy, heavier duty. It's meant okay. to last. But the thing with it is that a camera has like 25 pins that goes the CF card goes into the pin. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's say you put the card in a little crooked uh -huh. and you bend a pin. You can no longer put memory cards in that camera. Mm -hmm. And if you do and you push the card too hard, the pin could also damage the memory card. Right. So you could also just think you're recording something and, and then they go. Ah, so, it, you know, it's like oh, that yeah. last 10 kilometers on your car and you're you like, I it. can get somewhere on an empty tank. Well, you think you've got it. You think you've got the card and then you're fine. And then you realize that like it's corrupt. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of very fragile things about the photography, like the camera internal parts mm -hmm. itself. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, same like you're saying, like you're always paranoid about things. Like I put the card in not even thinking anymore, but like you just never know. Yeah, you got to be a smooth operator. Smooth yeah. operator, yeah. right. <laughs> but imagine wedding photographers. Oh, because that's even worse. I know. Yes. Luckily, I'm not in that position. I've stayed away from weddings because it's just not my thing. No. Yeah. Too romantic for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, like one of the events that comes to mind when I think of you is the um, the Ramsey event. Okay. The Ramsey Amex uh, shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I was at one of those meals. Mm. And, um, you know, that one when I was thinking about you know, a, a batch of photos that you would not want to lose yeah. for a fantastic client. That yeah. You'd obviously want to, you know, have their make photo, sure make sure that. that they have that. Yeah. Um. So, what, I mean, first of all, what was it like working with Ramsey? I mean, how much yeah. time did you get with him? I mean, it's pretty like crazy. Gordon Ramsey. Yeah. Like yeah, just yeah, Gordon Ramsey. Listening. Yeah. Chef sorry. Ram Chef, Chef Ramsey. Chef Ramsey. Yeah. The one and only. Yeah. The, the uh, yeah. The one and only. I mean, so that kind of event, for instance, people don't really understand the the hecticness that it is as a photographer to deliver that type of experience for a client. So first, let's go back. My client was American Express and right. I was shooting an experience, dining experience with Gordon Ramsay. For days or for, was it one full day? It was day one of day with him and then there was another day with a different chef. Yeah, uh, with Maddie. Yeah, Absolutely. well, no. Yeah, yeah. That's the Maddie. one I ended up at. Okay, so you miss Gordon. Mm. Yeah, no, I know. Darn. Don't tell me about it. I know. Well, I will, actually. Yeah, tell it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that kind of event, for instance, is pretty high stress. So yeah, you go yeah. into it, A, you've watched the guy on TV for years, and the yeah. only thing you know from experience is Hell's Kitchen. And he yeah, yells absolutely. So, like, he yells. So, like, if you're not on his good side, it's just the F word every second. Mm -hmm. So, you're like, am I going to get yelled at? Yeah. Am I going to get the F word? Like, what if I fuck up? Like, yeah. technically. Yeah. I was like, is he going to say something? But... The beauty about working with super experienced professional people like himself is like, yes, that's his TV personality. Yeah. But like from a one on one communication, like a kind of a conversation kind of guy, super humble, super down mm -hmm. to earth. Yeah. Like I wasn't shocked one bit when we introduced each other. It was a little handshake. And, you know, I always get introduced by the client. You. It was fun. Yeah. yeah. It was very easy because I also <laughs> like. I think what's important too for me is we can go backtrack later, but I, when I first got out of college from photography, I didn't go straight into like trying to be with small businesses and, and talk with people who didn't have photography experience or being in the, in the spotlight. I kind of found myself in a space where I was like right in it and yeah. I, and I got right into it really quickly and and I used to work very closely with professional athletes. So yes. right, because you working were in, in that space, MLSE was really quick. and Cirque du Soleil early. Yeah, yeah. But so because I learned how to communicate 
with people who, you know, it's a thing. Like, it's like, when they think, oh, great, someone's going to take my picture, is it going to be like someone who's fangirling and be like, oh, my God, it's such a great experience to be here with you. And right. like, can I also get a picture on my phone right. after? Yeah, exactly. Or you're just like, hey, nice to meet you, chef. Fancy. Gordon. Yeah. Ramsey. How would you prefer? And then he goes, just call me chef. And it's great. OK, so let's just do a couple photos. And I just jump right into it. So yeah, that way I'm not really worrying about like anything else but doing my job. Yeah, right. That's and you know what? Some of the best photographers that I've worked with are assertive and tell you what the heck they want. Mm. Um, some of the worst I've worked with are like, well, what do you think? You know, like, I don't like that. that. I don't like that. Like, like one of the, the it's actually quite nice because it's almost like no matter who you work with, you do your job better kind of bossing them around. Like even if you're working with him. <laughs> which yeah. is really pretty fun. Which at first was like kind of intimidating. I was right. like, okay, how do I go into this and like be polite? Because the way I see it is this guy spends his life on TV. Oh, so yeah. he already knows like if the lighting is right or if the mm -hmm. yeah. if his position is okay or if I'm even shooting at the right angles. Like sometimes I think in the back of my head, I'm like, these people are totally judging me right now. Yeah. Yes, but sure. I also think about it in the sense of like, I've been hired to do this job because I'm really good at what I do. So yeah. I go into it, like you were saying, a bit more like of a boss. And I, yeah. I kind of tell them what I need and what I mm -hmm. want. But I think with experience, too, over the years, I've built so much more confidence and assertiveness that when I go to someone and I'm like, let's do it this way, they don't question my yeah. direction. They're like, okay, this person already has a vision. Let's just go. Yeah. And and I think like with him even, I was given like four stations kind of because the mm -hmm. space was kind of tight. Yeah. So I found four spots and I just ran with it. And even then within like 15 minutes, we had gotten everything we needed and the client was super happy and we just move on with our lives. Yeah. So um, for instance, like we were saying that it was a crazy hectic event. So I actually was also shooting and then editing and they were posting on Twitter in live in uh, real time, in man. real time. Oh, man. So basically that kind of day you see is you arrive at 9 a.m. and you do all of your location shots. And then Ramsey arrives at 10. He has like a CP24 or an ET interview. And then you go in and you have your 15 minutes of shooting with him. And then you leave that and you find the closest coffee shop in Kensington Market. You post up with your laptop. You plug in your cards. The Amex client is next to you. You go, 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 go. You choose your images. You're editing them. You Dropbox it to them and then you walk back in and you do the next thing all over again within 25 minutes yeah. yeah and and that's a different level that people just don't understand that like maybe that's why I was picked for that job because I can do those things under pressure yeah absolutely so that yeah the, meeting him was a blast um shortly lived experience to say because it was really like a five-hour event yeah but super cool guy and he's like on the top of my website just because it's like not even something to like brag about. Yeah. But it's something to be proud about because I obsessively watch his shows. All yeah, I that. love his stuff. We watch his yeah. stuff. Like all of yeah. his stuff. All so of his stuff. it's just been one of those things where I'm like, yeah, like these are some of my better moments. Maybe not some of my more technical photos, but it's yeah. something that I can be proud of. And I think that's another direction of what I've done for my website is that like I don't just post my best work. I post the work that. I feel like brings me more happiness because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's where my direction is with my business. Yeah. I don't want to always just work with you because you want to flash a good budget and you want a really stuffy photo because I might not actually take it. If you tell me, hey, we're going to go do something super fun and it's going to be a half a day or a full day and we've got a smaller budget. But I'm like, huh, does this spark joy? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to take it. Yeah. Because a, a lot about being a freelancer is about your happiness, too. Yeah, totally. It's not just about taking every job and hustling. Like, mm -hmm. the pandemic has shown me that. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I don't want to just say yes to everything. The pandemic has taught me, like, take a step back and find yourself and your happiness and then choose what you want because that will make you a more successful person. Yeah, I think right. that's really Fantastic. important to, like... um Pursue things that bring you joy. And oh, by yeah. doing that, you will bring more joy into your life. And it also brings you more business. Yeah. I hate yeah. to say yeah. it, but yeah, like, it does. I, I feel that, you know, I used to be like a full, I was freelance um, until like pandemic time. I had been a freelancer for like almost 10 years. And oh, I, yeah. and I was like full, full time influencer kind of person. And a lot of that wasn't really bringing me joy. I wanted to 
do something else that was more collaborative and more yeah. team. And, and I'm very happy now, but I had made a shift because doing like, not like. Yeah. Taking a selfie all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't. Or like, you know, posting something that was like a sponsored thing that maybe I was saying yes to because I was freelance and needed to help pay the mortgage, but I wasn't really into it. And I didn't want to put myself in that situation anymore because I wanted to pursue things that really genuinely made me feel joy and happy. And yeah. I feel that now. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's Shameless promotion yeah. right there. <laughs> I love that. No, I really am happy though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Look, we always have a wonderful time at work. Yeah, we laugh a lot. We laugh a lot at work. Do you guys I know. work even? This is like, yeah, we're working. <laughs> no, well, but the like, thing is, as you know, you end up working all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the good thing about that too, though, is what is that quote about if you do something that you love yeah, exactly. For the rest of your life, like you'll never call it work or it's never work. Yeah. Um, do you know what I mean? You, uh, find, you, you won't. So, yeah. You'll never have to, to work a day in your life yes, if you it. do what you love or something yeah. along that. But there's also um, uh, Instagram trending sound that it's like, I didn't want to work no, at nine I to five. To, so yeah. I, I used to I oh, used to work nine to five and I didn't like what I was doing. So I started my own business and now I work 24-7. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Basically. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think it's, um, it's like I would rather work more doing something I enjoy versus when you're in a job and you're like, fuck, I hate this. Yeah. Or when Monday, like I wrote a blog post ages ago and it's like, if you hate, if, if you hate Monday, maybe you should think about changing your job because I actually look mm. forward to, I look forward to Monday cause I'm like, what's going to happen this week? <laughs> you know, like, cause I don't know. And yeah. something, something exciting always happens or I get an email or Nelson and I book a new guest or yeah, we're yeah, doing yeah. something exciting. I enjoy my time off and I enjoy, you know, relaxing and, you know, everything like that. But I mean, when Monday comes, I'm like, Fun things gonna happen this What's week. What's gonna happen this week? Yeah, and you oh, know when yeah. I look on when we get to Friday and we kind of do a repack recap of our week and we look back, I'm like, shit, we do a lot of cool stuff this week. <laughs> That's and cool. I think, like I was thinking yesterday, I was like, wow, I really laughed a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, chalk up ten on the fun quota because, like, I. I like well, one of the things that's really nice about the way that we work too is um it went in development you use a methodology called agile methodology okay and part of that process is doing not only daily stand-ups which um everybody who's part of the team really submits what they did yesterday what they're focused on today and if they have any blockers oh interesting and so every day hit in, in the entire history of hover I literally have every single day of every employees and every person involved in the companies internally um what they did yesterday what they're doing oh today and what they you know if they have any blockers <gasps> but the wonderful thing about it is um you really can understand what the heck you're getting done in a very granular sense mm -hmm. so when we start our weeks um, we're not only um, keeping track of what we're focused on each day, but we also keep track of what our goals are for the entire week. That's kind of cool. Goal and, setting and yeah, it's and really we have good. it all mapped out because you know what? There's so many little components when you're developing tech and to a to a business that if you don't, your head's spinning. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's constantly just going through things that maybe you should be doing or you have to do, and we're constantly trying to remove things from our heads and. Get them organized into a document. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah. Um, and um, so we were talking about, you know, not having to work a day in our lives. Yeah. And photography, how early in your life did you recognize that that was going to be a career that wasn't yeah. going to feel like work? Yeah. I mean, it didn't kick in until I became a freelancer. It really didn't kick in until I decided to you know, leave that nine to five working in a studio and mm -hmm. just take the oh, so you initially okay. were working in a studio. Yeah. I was going to ask, I read an interview um, of you. I was doing some research. Oh, cool. <laughs> creeping. Um, yeah, I'm doing research. <laughs> I was <laughs> creeping. Was it like the Bay Street Bull article? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, you were in, you went to school on a sports scholarship. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. then you found the dark room. Yeah. See? Yeah. So I actually am from a super small town. Well, I say small people from there would kill me. Um, I'm from Moncton, New Brunswick. So I, okay. I grew up in the Maritimes. So um, we don't get a lot of exposure 
uh, like our soccer and everything, we don't get a lot of exposure to move up in our lives, in our careers. It's more like, uh, you know, you play soccer. If you get seen, you're lucky, you move on, you kind of thing. But a lot of people from our town too, being a small town, a lot of people just like to stay small town. Yeah. They like to play there, go to school there, go to university there, start a family there, buy a house there, whatever. Yeah. But for me, I think, I don't even know that I ever really had it in me to be an entrepreneur for the rest of my life. Like, I I don't know that that was a thing. Like, I don't even know if I ever had a lemonade stand as a kid. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know that that was my thing. But one thing I do know is that I was like super, super involved in arts from a very young age. So before cameras and all of that was even an option for me, like I was painting, I would go to arts camps, I'd go to pottery camp I'd go to like (laughs) I do science camp and sports camp but like I was always so much more into it when I was doing arts Mm -hmm. so I played soccer we were playing for like a provincial team we played into a tournament in Manitoba and all kinds of coaches came from uh, the states and I was did you bust no I I think we flew but we were playing against players from all over the world. So we played against like Ireland, Brazil, Colombia. And that is obviously wow. the perfect opportunity. And I was 13. So this is perfect opportunity for any high school coach to come in and basically see anyone from all over the world that probably are the best teams because they got to travel to this tournament called the Schwan Cup. Oh, what a great Which name. is weird because it had a swan <laughs> as a logo, but it was the Schwan Cup. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, (laughs) but, um, we basically had coaches from all over the States come in and they were checking and like, you can't personally get approached by a coach if you're like under the high school age. Right. So they would go to your parents and give business cards. So I had gotten a couple business cards throughout that tournament. So clearly I had a good tournament. Yeah. Um, And my parents, when we got home, they were like, listen, we can look into some options. And I just don't know if you want to go. Cause I was the kind of kid that like at three in the morning, if I was staying a baby, I was like having a sleepover at my cousin's house. I would call my mom at three to pick me up. Cause I was homesick. Yeah. Yeah. So like I couldn't sleep over. I, even I, until, I wasn't, I didn't do sleepovers. Early no, either. even until the age of like 12, I'd yeah. like wake up and be like, nope, nope. 3 AM. Oh. Like, at the staircase yeah. upstairs, mom picked me up. I understand. Like that. I was a child until I was. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. That. So Part you're like, it yeah, was me too. the accommodations weren't up to <laughs> par, but uh, okay, <laughs> now then, okay. So Italian, Italian would call me fancy. Okay, yeah. my wife would call me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe that's how you got your day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, too fancy for this sleepover, right? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, but so like, here's the thing. Did you guys know that fancy's my last name? Is no. It, is it actually your last yeah. name? Yeah. Oh, we didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I was. I wanted to ask because I didn't know if it was a. That's it's why not, it's. it's just mind. call me fancy because people are like, oh, you think you're fancy? I'm like, no, it's my last name. So just please just call me fancy. Yeah. It's like my motto. I just I got really lucky. My dad. Yeah. A Scotia boy. But listen, fancy was our last name. So we got lucky. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah. Wow. But to rewind, Great I was last name. Now yeah. that I know it's your last yeah, name. Now you will really call me fancy because, yeah. you know, it's part of my name. Um, (laughs) so I got recruited. I chose an American school. I went into the program there and I went on a scholarship. I was already finishing grade 10 in high school back home in French, which was interesting because now I was going to an English school in the States. Oh, you can speak French then. So French is my first language. Oh yeah. So my Uh, mom is an Acadian. I know. My mom's last name is Gauguin. So we're oh. very much a French family. Wow. They could they had no success teaching me French. No? No. Just French immersion wasn't your jam? They don't know how to teach it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got lucky. <laughs> we spend so much time on il, l, ju- like we spent we spent so <laughs> much time on l grammar. Grammar. Mm-hmm. I couldn't ask you where a bathroom was. Oh, <laughs> they don't approach it properly. Okay, they've got to approach. You need to know your basics. Like if you go if to Paris, how do you get your croissant? How do you get a water? Where's right. the washroom? How do I get yeah. a car? Right. And what time is it? Exactly. Yeah. I spent the better part of my youth in French classes. Yeah. Couldn't get a croissant. <laughs> Could, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't find a bathroom. Couldn't find. What can I tell you? I can tell you L. Oui, okay. well, like, I can't even tell you when to use it. Yeah. I know it's feminine. Yeah. Okay. L, il. Il is masculine. Masculine. Yeah. But Je is you. Right. But um, 
That's their fail, okay? <laughs> That's not my fail. The system is corrupt. Well, the yeah. system failed me on French because I like croissants. <laughs> <laughs> and now when you go to Paris, you're... Well, the joke Google is Paris, ca- Paris caught up. They I understand know. English. I know. Yeah, so it's I go to Paris. It's one of those jokes. They just look at you and they and you say, puis revoir in croissant. And they're like, what would you like? Yeah, uh, no, exactly. Like, just speak to me in English. And, and you know what? Actually, um, because of Uber, you really don't need to speak the local language as much as even you did five years ago, ten years ago. Why? Well, because you don't have to ask a cab to go anywhere. Oh, I totally. You I get that, in. You, you, you're being taken. Like destination, please. It's, it's yeah. already there. And do you guys put your headphones in when you're in an Uber and you just Sometimes. zone out? I mean, do you guys no. ever ask for them to put the air conditioning on or turn the put the windows down? I asked them to do it cold to make it cold. I think I'm also just way too nice, and I'll be like in the wet in back seat sweating, and I'm like, "Do oh, I no, just no, put no. my window down? Can I do it?" <laughs> yeah. And then I do it, and I'm like, "He didn't say anything. We're good." Have you noticed? Okay, so growing up, I've never been. I wasn't aware of this, like air conditioning or windows. Like I didn't know there was an or. Okay. Oh. Air conditioning Typically. or windows. Okay. Yeah, like, I mean, you're not going to every like Uber I get. Oh, don't. And then open the window. Window. Uber. 30 I've window been in heat. Ubers where I've, I've requested AC, okay? And the AC's on, the windows are closed. And then I've opened the window a little bit to just get some airflow, especially with, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. I open the window a bit. He turns the AC off. Go like this isn't like a factory where it's we're also worried not about like the your cost. hydro bill. Like, it's not a yeah. hydro bill. Your car doesn't yeah. have a hydro bill. It's like you're burning a bit of gas. Window but still. either or thing. I never knew about it, but it's creeped me. You know. I feel like that would be a good, a better circulation of your air. Yeah, it's like airplanes. I mean, clearly we'll never have a window to breathe out of, but like when the AC is pumping, you can feel it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and like even with work and when like traveling, mm. like on a trip, I can recover better. I find the I take my time and I find the juice press place, and I'm like shot of ginger and lemon, please. Mm-hmm. But when you're like traveling for work and you haven't slept and you're in the plane and this AC stuff, I typically come home sick. Mm-hmm. Right, like the immune yeah. system just shuts. Yeah, you've traveled and through France and 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 worked yeah. in France, right? Yeah, I have. That yes. was a pretty cool trip. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so that was a many years ago. You're perfect for that. If you can speak. I know. French. That's French. actually French. funny French. too. Like L at them. L L <laughs> croissant. Yeah. But like I had also just recently shot Oshiega. Right. Um, like in Montreal. Yes. And I was with uh, my client and they didn't know that I spoke French. And I literally sat at the table. And we were all ordering dinner. And I was just like, puis avoir un verre d'eau, s'il vous plaît. And they all looked at me and they're like, I'm sorry, what? Oh, wow. <laughs> you speak French? And it this was our whole time. It was our second day being there. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, since when? <laughs> I'm like, French is my first language. And they're like, and you haven't been ordering for us this whole time? <laughs> and I'm like, listen, I got to be humble about a few things here. Yeah. I'm not trying to like step over anyone's shoes. Yeah. But like when you when you speak French, sometimes they're like, what? But yeah, France. You don't sound like French is your first language. I mean, sometimes if I like say something that has a bit of an accent to it. Mm. And yeah. then they're like, mm, English isn't your first. And mm-hmm. I'm like, well, it is. Yeah. Because I, I like in New Brunswick, people. it's 50 <laughs> 50. It's really 50-50 in New Brunswick. Like, we do yeah. practice English as much as we p- practice French. So, I wouldn't say that I necessarily have an accent. Even it's just, like, some words will sound a little bit more French mm-hmm. than others. Yes. yes. I do that. None of those words. Did. In what but, language? Um, because my family's from New Zealand. Okay. Um, so, I yeah. obviously... She, in she English, can really turn it on. If but, you um, <laughs> but I had a New Zealand accent when I was a child. Um, so certain things. I think or, just saying child, I just heard it. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. Like she went into New Zealand mode. When I about talk it. about yes. New Zealand instead of New Zealand, New Zealand. Yes. You know? child. Uh, but, or when I ring mom uh, or my, talk to my parents, uh, it comes out. When you ring mom, is that a, like a slang in New Zealand? No, like, call, yeah, when I call my mom. I know. <laughs> when I ring mom. <laughs> when yes. I ring mom. Yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, that's a British phrase too. The yeah, Eng- ring. Uh, yeah, and mum like M U M, not yeah M U M. Yeah, um, Paris was exceptional. I was there with a company, and uh, she was an influencer as well. And we were there shooting for uh, Louis Thirteen, mm. Remy Martin, Louis Thirteen. So we know it well because fancy, it's- very fancy. No pun intended. <laughs> 
Um, but the whole thing was capturing the experience of how they distill and how they are as a family and where their grounds are and stuff. So we landed obviously in Paris. And then eventually we took the TGV, which is like that train that you literally get to everywhere in 45 minutes. And we oh, went, you went on that fast train. Yeah. That and, hyper train. Yeah. Something. So we went yeah, into Cognac. I think it's actually Cognac is the place, which is where like you can really only have proper Cognac. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that's where I was. It's been so long. <laughs> but it's like I didn't know that champagne was only champagne when it's made in Champagne. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, let's get some champagne. And you're like, you know, when you're young, you're like, champagne. And it's like Prosecco. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You're like, oh, this is not French at all. Yeah, no. You're like, pretend to be. (laughs) But no one needs to know. No. But um, yeah, so we went and we stayed in a castle for a couple days. Beautiful. And photographed like the distilling and the experience. And then we got to try like a pipette of like a hundred year old barreled family owned Wow. Cognac? Yeah. Of the Louis XIII oh, family. Louis oh, wow. But we went like underground and then there I couldn't photograph. I had to leave my camera upstairs. Very like private area where the wow. family has been distilling some yeah. of their like tricks for years. Yeah. So it's, you want to rip off their tricks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put yeah. a barrel in the corner here. <laughs> little <laughs> little Snapchat yeah. glasses with a camera. I used to have those glasses. I actually love them. <laughs> I nice. love that. We could send you in there to look yeah. at the tricks. <laughs> Google like, glass. Little button Start camera. making some cognac. <laughs> yeah, uh, making a career shift, guys. Yeah. <laughs> cognac in my basement. Yeah. But that had actually been the second time I was in Paris. Um or in France, I should say in general. But um, prior to that, I had done a massive one month trip right after graduating college to Morocco. Cool. Mm. So I spent a month there, but our layover was a couple days in France. So we stayed in Paris and we were in the different quartiers. So we were like in the different districts and we got to explore that. Um, so that was my first time ever being in Europe. And then finally, when I went back, it was like, ah. Oh, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Different spaces. And especially when you're older, yeah. your experiences are so different. Oh, yeah. Like you find these little coffee shops and you can actually like sit and sit enjoy the scenery. Or like if you're walking around on your own and you pass a little bridge and there's a guy playing a little guitar, but there's like a wine place right next door and there's chairs and tables and you literally, you don't even like face the restaurant anymore. You just plop your chair facing the guy playing. You just like yeah. drink a little glass of wine. It's like Paris is insane. Yeah, they, I would they've live mastered there. the patio. Mm, the patio experience. Yeah, yeah. they've really mastered the Unlike patio Unlike the cement blocks there. in Toronto. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> or the, um, the cement well, blocks and the you're eating on the street. Yeah. You're literally, yeah. <laughs> well, there's a construction, there's a pile of dirt and construction <laughs> and a bus and like <laughs> you're in the garbage face. Well, the street to sidewalk ratio in Paris, in most of the, oh, it's this, amazing. the, the main areas. Is and amazing. they're all cobblestone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like super like we built this hundreds of years ago and we're not changing it. Yeah. They're like our sidewalks are 20 feet wide because... Like we want that dining, like now yeah. we want that dining experience, but we also want people to enjoy their walks. Yeah. It's, I find like, and it's walkable. I was going to say Paris Small. is way more pedestrian yeah. than driving. Like uh, I don't think I'd ever rent a car if I was in Paris. No. I haven't been to Paris, but I went to Cannes oh. film once, but I would like to go to Paris. Yeah. Gotta do it. Okay. Not Paris, Ontario, by the way. No, yeah. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> it's walkable too. <laughs> <laughs> It's like that's got that going for it. It's got that going for 30 minutes yeah. from one point to the one other. Point, the main strip, there's like a Tim Hortons, a Mr. Sub, and a cast station, and an antique store. Right. Well, I was shocked um, at how walkable Paris was. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. basically can see the main attractions outdoors, see them from the outside in one day. Really? You saw every single thing. Like oh, you can yeah. see, you can the see Louvre. the Louvre. You can see... Um, um, the Eiffel. The Eiffel. Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. We saw day. it when it was in its, you know, prime. <laughs> <laughs> when it was still erect. <laughs> Before she went limp. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know what happened to it. I was there. I Sorry. had a, I was no smoking, filter. I was smoking that cigarette in the attic. I flicked the cigarette. I left it. The whole place changed. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, we saw that. Uh, but you know what, Case? You can basically see everything but Versailles in the day mm-hmm. if you don't want to walk in. And what ended up happening to Talia and I, it was such a it was such beautiful weather. We didn't want to go inside anywhere anyways. Yeah. And we were there for maybe like four days. Did you just, go like in fall? Yeah. Yeah. It was fall. You don't go in the summer. I heard uh, it's pretty hot. Is this the summer? Yeah. Probably. Probably. But like, Never dared also, to do it. Think about it. Like, Paris is a fashion city. Like, you want to go and in like, layers. You, out yeah. Yes. I don't want to walk around in a tank top and shorts and just be like, no. or let's take a cute photo in front of the cathedral. I want a layer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. You want to look cool. It's a layered town. Yes. When I went to... <laughs> like it croissants. Is. Like a croissant. <laughs> it's like a croissant. I yeah. think I went to... Cannes film, but it was like May. It was pretty nice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Cannes is closest to the water too. Though, yeah. So it's like it was a lot cooler, and it was you probably didn't nice. suffer like downtown. No, I remember wearing distinctly wearing a selection of great outfits, not being too hot, and it was lovely. <laughs> oh. I'll keep that in mind. Next, time. I would love to go to Paris this fall if I could renew my goddamn passport. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> There's, Why? It's so. It's oh, it just, just there's taking backlog. a while now. Backlog big old backlog so when i drive by victoria park like, and queen <laughs> every morning there's like a concert lineup yeah or like I, waiting I, for an autograph from harry styles or something <laughs> <laughs> you have all these younger teens yeah. and kids and like the 30s who just want to get out of toronto and then they realize their passport expired yeah so they're all frantically waiting to get in line to get their passport renewed oh yeah i went at 7 a.m once waited for three hours and then i was like fuck this i'm i cancel i'm gonna give up I was going to go to South by. I had a ticket booked. I was like going. I remember. Remember? And I was like going to get my passport yeah. tomorrow. Yee. And then. Um, did you half want to go though? And then that's Yeah, I did half want to go. Half want to go. I feel like if she fully wanted you to go. She would have been in line. She would have been in line. I yeah. got but, cancellation insurance. I was like, YOLO. See you later. Sean can go. Fires. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Look, I've pulled out of many lines. Many a line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I've always got a 7 a.m. job the next day that pulls me from 10 p.m. plans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I think I just also, as a homebody for myself, I just get super anxious doing anything super social. Mm. Like, well, I, it's, congratulations it's funny. Congratulations coming here. Yeah. Uh, you I know what? That, it's a step. I yeah. feel that now. You wouldn't know. Like, I used to go out, I mean, you know, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, every day. Slide this way oh. a little bit, Case. Perfect. Um, but I I love being at home so much. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what's really funny about that, too, is, like, here's an interesting, like, weird personality interpretation that people have of me. So, like, I have to be social because I'm in these events Mm -hmm. and I have to start conversations with people and I have to interact and being like, so nice to see you, which like, obviously when I say it, it's actually authentic. It's nice to see people, especially now during the pandemic and now finally revisiting all these people in my life. Yeah. This is part of why we wanted to do this, but I'm an extreme high functioning introvert. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a homebody at like a fault. Mm -hmm. Like if someone wants to go out and socialize, it's really only like my five few close friends that I will invest that energy in. And I will not do it in like a nightclub or I won't do it. And like if I did it into a nightclub, which one of my friends is a promoter and I would go to his events, but I would only do it if I was in the right mindset Yeah, Mm -hmm. because it takes a lot of energy. So for instance, for work wise, if I'm working events and you guys have both seen me working Mm -hmm. the nightlife events of like galas or dinners or cocktail events when everyone gets super loud, it takes a lot of energy out of me. Like it really drains me. I get home and like, I am like non-functioning. Yeah. Yeah. Like I go quiet for six hours. Mm -hmm. Like I go, I go home and I also have a hard time decompressing from it because it's like being in a concert. Everything is so high sensory and everyone else is having drinks and they're laid back and I'm sober looking at everyone yelling around the room and there's high DJ music and I have to let, yeah, that is. And then I have to like, you know, put up with this. You're the loud one. Yeah, Yeah, she's the loud one. (laughs) And then, you know, you finally get home and you're like, literally your heart rate is still going the speed of the DJ's music and then you're just like, how do you chill? And then, you have to find a place of being like, okay with the anxiety. Mm-hmm. So like being an introvert and also just coping with kind of that anxiety of working on that level of interaction so much. I've kind of just like figured out how to manage it. But then you go to the next day, it's like you're either working like a 12 hour campaign 
or you're doing like something really chill where you're like doing photos for like a bank Mm -hmm. and you go from like boom, 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 the night before to being like, Hey, okay. So let's just sit you here in this chair. Let's turn you a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you really have to know like how to switch on and off. Mm -hmm. And I, and, and that's one of the hardest things about our jobs too. It's like, there are a lot of people who are super particular and they just do events. Right. Mm-hmm. And there are certain people like club photographers, like, you know, they're just club photographers because that's their life. Like they shoot from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. and then they edit it the next morning and then they sleep all day and then they do the same thing every night. Right. But like for me, it's like one day I've got a shoot that I'm setting up at 7 a.m. And I like yesterday I set up at 8 a.m. and I finish at 30 p.m. So mm-hmm. I spent, you know, a 12 hour day on set and then. This morning I went to jujitsu because I just wanted to do something active, but I woke up in complete, like, I didn't have my voice this morning. Right. Like I was slow as a snail, like drinking water was making me nauseous. And it's because like everything is such high pace that I have a really hard time turning it back down. Yeah, absolutely. So, and the thing is, every time that you work a 12 hour shift, yeah. you're basically creating more work for yourself because oh, 100%. the longer you work, I think I took 2,000 photos yesterday. So then I also got to gotta edit that. Right. Yeah. So you're dealing with, um, and you do that yourself. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, I started sourcing some things out, which was really smart. Um, I do have an, ed- an editor now on my team that does all my skin retouching. Uh, something like yeah, if I do headshots for a company. Um, which wasn't really my shtick for the beginning, but I enjoy it if it's like a business that I can appreciate. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, I'll go in and I'll do like, for instance, I do Mercedes Benz dealerships. Mm -hmm. So I'll go in and I'll do all their headshots over a day or two days because there's like a hundred staffs, but then I'll shoot everything. And then I have my editor do all the skin retouching. That kind of makes my job a little bit more, uh, a little easier, but also more interesting because I can focus on like the things that I enjoy about that. Yeah. Like the interaction with people, but also super professional staffs. And it's like very much like you don't have to make a massive conversation. So being an introvert in that case too, I'm like, okay, so let's just turn you slightly. Let's get this light here. Okay. You're just going to smile, show some teeth. Yeah. Hide your teeth. (laughs) Okay. Okay, Maybe that's not a good one. (laughs) Let's switch it up. (laughs) And then you just kind of like filter through that. And then you, you send off your editing so you can like really focus focus on what you love and you can delegate the things you don't. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're not editing this thing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We're here chatting. Listen, we're all really good at certain things. Yeah. (laughs) And some things we're just not. Yeah. Which is also like why I'm not a videographer. And I've been asked to do that multiple times. Right. You're like, no. I'm like, I refuse. Creating that sort of team or that engine Mm -hmm. that can that can allow you to produce in the volume you need to produce yeah. is, is so critical. Yeah. Because if you don't have those pieces in place, it, it really, um, you're the one that suffers. Yeah. You know? And I was suffering. Yeah. I, and I realized that. So like we were talking way back about photo and how I got into it. When I went to my private school, they had a dark room and it was absolutely exceptional. So my mom had taken photography in college and sends me her old raggedy Fuji film camera. She didn't even know if it still worked. So I started using it. And then my teacher at that time saw so much potential, like shout out to Chris Vivier because he started my entire career. Yeah. Um, And he basically saw so much potential that he was like, here's my old film camera. You can borrow it or if you want to buy it from me, your parents can transfer me money. (laughs) And I purchased the camera from him and it just was like my calling. Yeah. And I was finding like, but that's the same thing. Like in high school, I was playing on the soccer team in the summer. I was playing on the basketball team in the winter. I was playing softball in the fall and I was playing lacrosse in the spring. So I was playing four sports in high school every year for three years. Um, And on top of that, when I didn't have practice, I'd go and develop in the darkroom because he'd give me access. Or I was on the set design team for their theater team. So I would build out all of the sets that they would do their shows. So we did like an Alice in Wonderland. In my second year there, I built these mushrooms out of plexi and fiberglass. So like I was like never taking a day off. Mm -hmm. But I also lived there without my family. So I wasn't spending a lot of time 
you know, with mom and dad or my sister, I was very much there to like be educated, play a sport oh, and was, learn a lot of new things. This was a way school. So my what high school was in New Hampshire. So I was in the States. I was in an American system. I was oh. on like a student visa. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And so, so because lived at the high school. Yes. I was oh, room and so, board. Oh, so because and that's I the funny thing that about how we were saying that the it. sleepover yeah. thing <laughs> two years later, it was like do you really want to do this? And my parents were like, I don't think this is going to f- be a fit. Mm. And I was like, well, we're not going to know until I get there. And literally my parents being so used to me calling my first week was all soccer training for preseason. And I hadn't called my parents once. Wow, so they, <laughs> so they were like, were well, well, I guess she's fine. Yeah, I guess that's it. And I was like, I'm fine. I'm just checking in. I'm alive. I'm just yeah. really busy. And Amazing. I think like, I think that's where, like, I started to realize, like, I'm super independent. Mm-hmm. Like, I just actually like being alone. It's just that I had a lot of support that I thought that's what I needed to, like, succeed. But, um, yeah, so I was in New Hampshire. So because I had done grade 9 and grade 10 back home, but in a French system, they wanted me to do grade 10 again, grade 11 and grade 12, so I could be on a three-year scholarship. So I would be the senior team on the soccer team That because like every year people were graduating, they wanted to make sure that like when someone left, there was always someone in the next year that could replace that position, let's say. So they offered me three years. So I took five years of high school, but I did two in French and then I did three in English. So when you do like grade 10 bio, I did grade 10 bio in French and then I did grade 10 bio again in English. So I did that and I was literally it. It built so much structure into my life that I think it also plays into like how I am now and who I am now as a business owner that we would wake up, we'd have, you know, any type of potential activity in the morning, some training. And then you'd have breakfast, school, school would finish at three, soccer practice from like three to five, five thirty. And then sometimes you'd have dinner with your team and then you'd go into study hall from eight to 10 p.m. at school. So you do your homework at school. So like literally you had no excuse to fail yeah. right? because the teacher was in class. If you had a question, you could ask them. They might not be your science teacher, but they could ask the science teacher to help you. So I learned so much discipline in that sense that like, I think that's also why now I'm such a night hawk too. Like you wake up at 6 a.m., you do school and you do school until 10. Yeah. So with my work ethic, it's like I wake up. And I go to work and I don't finish until my job is done. And if it's 10 p.m., 11 p.m., midnight, one in the morning, it is what it is. But I've been structured that way as a younger person that it's just like in my DNA now. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, that's I that's the goal of that system. Yeah. And it seems to work. Yeah. So then from there, I got recruited to play for Humber College in Toronto. Cool. And uh, Toronto's Humber College photography program is one of the hardest to get in in Canada. It's like highly competitive in the commercial world. And so there's typically 900 applicants a year and 52 get accepted. So when I sent out my application, it's funny because they were like, please send digital photos. And I had never picked up a digital camera before Wow! because I had been shooting black and white film for three years. Right. So my majority of my portfolio is black and white film. And then my teacher was like, well, we need to buy uh, some kind of camera that you can shoot digital. So I did the worst digital portfolio. Like if you looked at my photos now and you looked at my my application for college, I kid you not. I wish I had the photo still. I shot an apple in a tree and made everything in black and white. And the apple was red. <laughs> that was my Photoshop color gradient conversion whatever skills and my digital photography that was my portfolio so i think though with you still got in i got in (laughs) i think maybe because i was also we're getting recruited to play soccer it was like it helped me Mm -hmm. but i also think that they saw a lot of technique skills in the film side Mm -hmm. because film photography is 10 times harder than digital right oh digital you can count on photoshop even to this day if i take a photo and i know it's kind of shitty i know i can fix it in post yeah so i don't i don't beat myself up constraints but as long as you're in the middle yeah but like i don't beat myself up anymore being like ah this photo is like eh, mediocre Mm -hmm. i'm like no 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 this is gonna look bomb as fuck (laughs) yeah in photoshop (laughs) (laughs) because i've become way more yeah Yeah. i'll I'll fix this one don't worry (laughs) yeah but i've just become really good at that in that sense that I just um, can look at something that I've done and just be like, no, 
I can fix this. Mm-hmm. Like, like we were saying, Gordon Ramsay experience or like other people that I've worked with that are high profile. You know, I've, I've worked with a lot of really cool people, which is funny because I like never post them on my page or anything. <laughs> um, but when I work with them, I can be okay taking a mediocre photo and making it great with mm-hmm. my experience now. Yeah. Cause now I've been, a you know, I'm acclimated to being okay with mediocre to make it super pro in the end. Yeah. So as an athlete, what was it like then starting to work with MLSE and being around what yeah. basketball? What, what's Yeah. Forward? Well, so MLSE is the full program, right? It's like right. Uh, the Blue Jays, the Raptors oh, and no, the Leafs. The Leafs sports entertainment. Yeah. So that actually, so like how we were saying about how I started my career. So when you graduate, you go, well, before you graduate, you go into like your internship. Right. So you work in a studio, you get a bit of like skills there. And as a younger female, and I haven't grown since, so I'm five, two and a half. I'd like to say five, three, five, four, maybe. I don't know. Maybe my, yeah, whatever. I love the half. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I wear my orthotics. I'm a half inch up. So yeah, we're good. I have some in my shoes <laughs> yeah, too. I same. have like a little lift in there. Oh, you wear the lifts. I've I considered those. I got them. Yeah. I'll yeah. send you the link on Amazon. <laughs> They're great. <laughs> All my flat shoes have them because I'm also a little shorty. <laughs> well, there you go. But um, when I started right out of school, I had a really hard time finding a job. And it was mostly because I was applying as an assistant and... This goes back to 2009, which is when I graduated Humber. So that just aged me, but we know now. Um, I'm in my (laughs) mid-30s. And I applied to a bunch of studios. And sometimes when they'd see my resume, the question they'd respond with is, can you lift your own body weight? Because I'm 5'2", and I'm a, I was 125 pounds at the time. Mm-hmm. And they didn't feel like I was strong enough of an assistant to set up lights to carry their gear. Oh, this is a photography question. Yeah. They, this is a photo. So I, yeah. I was trying to figure, yeah, yeah, is this yeah. athletic? So stuff? they were okay, trying to They're basically trying to say you're you too petite to do the job. And I'm like, I'm sorry, an extension cord weighs like 2.5 pounds. Yeah. And a studio light. Why does it matter whether or not it's heavy to get on the stand? If I'm technical and I can help you be a better photographer as an assistant, like if I can pick up my own weight or not, it shouldn't be the issue. And also people didn't realize that I also had a very extensive athletic background. So they didn't even know whether or not I could. Yeah. But I struggled finding a job. So then my first job was actually in a studio with um, two brothers and their contract was MLSC. Okay. So I went into that contract, not me receiving it. It was like I was becoming, I was, became part of the crew. Um, and what I did with them was actually all of the Photoshopping and all of the computer work because they were an older group of brothers who Mm. had like very little skill in Photoshop. Mm. And because I grew up in that generation of knowing how to use softwares and they grew up in like film photography. Yes. I was their perfect in at shooting all these things. They were shooting all their digital things. And I was working on editing like action shots of a picture so that they would take this photo and turn it into a ticket. So when you buy your Blue Jays tickets, they're like, you know, and 2009, what was that? Like 13 years ago, those tickets were like printer printed and, you know, super old school. Like they put a player on the card. Now it's just like, looks like a ticket master. Everyone has the same thing. But at that time, that was the kind of thing that I did. So because I was super efficient in Photoshop and it taught me a lot to being there and learning how to do some tricks, I became really strong in the editing side. Mm -hmm. And so I was with them for four years and but on and off, I take on some freelancing opportunities because yeah. I wanted to obviously learn. Um, but a lot of what has taught me with them when I was younger is that I like learned everything about what not to do and what to do as a business. Mm-hmm. Oh, OK, so that's kind of where I started being like when I go freelance. Now I know all the tricks. Yeah. Like how to communicate with a client. What happens when they don't get what they need? How do you con- how, how do you start a conversation about making it better? Or if someone cancels on you, do you charge them for right. your time that's missed? Or, you know, just small things, yeah. very small logistic things that like, I was like, okay, I'm going to put that in my bank and yeah. I'm going to learn that. And then finally, it was like, 
the conversation between me and my parents was like, I, I really want to go freelance. I just don't know where to start. Yeah. And I started looking on Kijiji and certain things like that mm-hmm. and being like, I'm going to find something some point and it'll be like, hi, here's my CV. Here's my resume. Like yeah. I was hustling. Yeah. And I landed on one on Kijiji literally. Like I didn't get the, the, the Cirque du Soleil job just handed to me. Mm-hmm. There was an ad where it was like looking to photograph um, event and action shots for a like moving like a traveling performance team and I was like don't know what that is but I'm in sports I just finished with MLSC so this is a perfect fit because yeah. then I can be like well like I'm super proficient in yeah, it's all perfect. this editing it's, it's, so now I can just shoot it right. and then we can make both right like it's know? enough that you can craft a yeah. layup opportunity at yeah that one. So I applied for it. And then when I had an interview, then I found out that it was Cirque du Soleil. And I was like, holy shit. So I was like, okay. So when they had installed their um, OVO concert way back, I started working with the traveling manager. And I was basically shooting all of their evening like VIP um, uh, visa experiences mm-hmm. at the time. And then I would work on behind stage and front stage and photograph the gymnast during the performances. Oh, oh wow. So my first job ever as a freelancer was Cirque du Soleil. Cool. Which is super dope to say. Yeah. Did you travel like, with them? So after that three month experience, because they travel every three months, right. like, you okay. tense up and it's down. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was offered an opportunity to move to San Francisco to travel with the team. But I had just come back like two years before from high school in the States. Right. And I had just been like, I'm just getting my feet off the ground. And it was a great opportunity. But also when you think about like the exchange and everything. You're like, I'm making this in the States, but I'm a Canadian citizen. So really to live, I have to convert my exchange. And this is like not feasible right? Mm-hmm. as like a, you know, I'm going to live off of soup cans. Yeah. 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 But they yeah. were offering me housing, which was great. And then I'd literally live on a bus if I was traveling with them every three months. But the offer was there. But I think I was just like, you know what? I just moved to Toronto and I think this is a great city for me to live in. And mm-hmm. I haven't moved since. Yeah. I've just been traveling since, yeah. but I haven't moved since. So I guess you got sort of a glimpse into the circus life. A little I bit. did. <laughs> yeah. Which the was super cool though. Like? like the best experience. <laughs> yeah. The weirdest, but best experience was that the way that Cirque does their like craft services for lunch every day mm-hmm. is that they make meals from different places in the world so that like every gymnast can have a home cooked meal from home once a week. Oh, that's so nice. So like I learned like so many different dishes yeah over the the experience that like every lunch was like one day was like hungarian the next day was like chinese like that the next day was french Mm -hmm. the next day was like you could just imagine oh my god and i'd be like what like sometimes you kind of pick at it and you're like do you (laughs) this you put the pita in or do you put it on top of the pita like how do you but then you're just like okay this is insane like i don't even know what i'm eating but this is something that i'll probably never experience again yeah so that was cool but then when you're sitting next to these gymnasts and they don't speak a lick of english right you're like good job today (laughs) (laughs) photos good job and they're like ah yeah yeah Yeah. and you're just like this is it was the coolest thing yeah and I think at that time I was like what 24 23 Mm -hmm. not even 22 awesome and you're just getting so much exposure already into that life that I think that like set me to success you coming to San Francisco? Uh, no. No. Uh, yeah. I'm okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. I'll visit. Great food. Yeah. But- <laughs> great food. Really great food. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. My dad was in a circus in New Zealand. Really? Yeah, he was a gymnast, so he did trampoline performance. Yeah, wow. my dad was a trampoline coach. Uh, yeah, my dad. Yeah, he wild. Yeah, he would do all kinds of crazy flip crazy yeah would yeah, he yeah also like flip and then get caught in the air from people swinging on top of them no he wasn't a trappy easy person okay just a tramp a trampoline have a you, tramp have you seen <laughs> him on a trampoline? was a tramp you mean have oh, you geez. seen him on a trampoline like, yeah yeah i did trampoline when i was a kid and gymnastics oh, wow. so my and my dad was Pretty a coach cool. um at a club where i grew up in cambridge and it was like um people trained there for the olympics and stuff incredible yeah so awesome. all these years, you've <laughs> primarily focused on photography and editing. Yeah. And walk me through now how that evolves into your new business venture, yeah. Ripple Media Group. So I realized that I was spending way too many years saying no to other services. Because um, I, right. 
it's a good start. Yeah, I think like I just had such a good control on my own things that I didn't want to expand Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to lose control of the things that I had control over. So absolutely. So it was even minimal things like when people were like, hey, can you do this event? And I was already booked for something else. And I was like, no. And I was literally saying no because I didn't want to hire another photographer because I didn't want to lose the client from the other photographer. I literally just didn't Mm -hmm. listen. Photography is a cutthroat industry. There's a lot of us in them. There's a lot of us that want to be where certain people are and people thrive off getting the opportunity at a lesser price Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at a quicker delivery, you know? So I had a lot of anxiety letting other people in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially when like you're multi, Uh, talented in the industry and you can offer a lot of different services like services in a sense of like portraits interiors right food photography Mm -hmm. location travel these are all things that most people there's a location photographer they do interiors Mm -hmm. there's a food photographer they do food there's people they do people Mm -hmm. but that's why like I call myself a commercial lifestyle photographer right because I do a lot of commercial things but in a lifestyle way so you're not gonna see you're not gonna see super crazy technical car commercials that I've photographed because that's just not my shtick yeah I'd rather work with like the authentic thing or the person and make it look like what the reader or the viewer should see. Mm -hmm. So I'm less of a studio based person and I'm way more of a on location kind of person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if I was doing a job and someone was like, can you do this? And I couldn't, I would just say no, I would just turn it down. And I think it was because I knew that also a as a female photographer, we seem to be put into a bit of a hole. Like people just assume that we're wedding photographers or that we do boudoir or that we do headshots or we do, you know, beauty Mm -hmm. or we do, you know, fashion. And there's a really weird misconception because like sometimes when people would meet me and they'd be like, oh, you're a photographer. So like, do you do weddings? And I'm like, no, I photograph like MLSE, Cirque du Soleil gymnasts. I work with chefs. I work with restaurant owners. I photograph cars. I photograph. And then people are like, oh, OK. Oh, OK. Yeah. So you're like a photographer that does commercial stuff. I'm like, yeah, like, why would I have to be tunnel visioned into being a wedding photographer yeah. or being a certain, you know, so. Because I was saying no to a lot of things, I was losing a lot of opportunities, I felt. Because, like, also, if you have a new client being like, we'd love to hire you for this, and you say no, you'll never hear back from them because they'll hire someone else and they'll take the job. Right. Yeah. So, and they'll wiggle into all their other yeah, needs, potentially. Like, yeah. So after a while, I was like, this is stupid. Like, why am I saying no? Because also people were asking, we love the photography style you do. Can you do video? Right. And I was like, okay. Video? No, I won't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Right. But I know people who can do it. But I was turning down so many opportunities. So then I kind of went into the like, I think this was like four years ago is when I kind of started to build out Ripple, which is the agency that I started. And that's when I kind of like let my guard down a little bit more. And I think it's because I was at a point in my career, which I was 30. And I was at a point in my career and I was like, I've got my shit together. Yeah, I'm in a place that's comfortable with my clientele base that I'm not going to lose them. And I know the quality of service I can offer. So I'm not I'm not going to lose that by allowing someone else to take my spot temporarily. Mm -hmm. So I went into it being like, I'm not available, but let me find you someone on my team, my team, which on my team never existed four years ago. (laughs) But let me find someone on my team that I can send out for you. Yes. And then I would find the people that I knew that did the same thing that were also humble individuals because there are some people out there I'll never work with. Right. Mm -hmm. And that in Toronto, I'll make that clear. There are some people in Toronto I will never work with. And but other towns, too. Yeah. (laughs) but, (laughs) But. That's only because they're so competitive that they like forget the fact that like we're all in this to do a good job for the client, not to be cutthroat. But back to the thing is I was finding people that were really skilled at what they did, but I also could like vibe with their personalities. So then I was like, I trust you. 
Mm-hmm. So I was like, yeah. I'm going to hire you to do this job. You're going to go in, you're going to do the photos, you're going to do the edits, you're going to turn it out to me, and then I'm going to flip it to my client. Yeah. So the conversation between the client and my photographer at the time was like, hey guys, here's a quick intro to each other. Here's your contact information. They'll arrive at this time. And that was pretty much it because I wanted to micromanage everything else because I still wanted to be in control, but let go of a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. So it got to the point where, you know, I was getting so busy that I was having to hire out a lot. I was outsourcing a lot. And then video came into play. And then I met some videographers that were really good hard workers, but then they got really busy with their own. So then I'd find other people. Um, And then the guy that works for me now, Spencer Bell, he's incredible. We met on an Oshiega project through American Express four years ago, 2018. And he was a videographer and his and I personality, we were like, like stuck like glue, like we just at the hip all the time, chatty, chatty, good energies. And I knew I was like, when I need a videographer, he's my guy. Yeah. And then from that, I started hiring him for pretty much anything. And in the past four years, I have had him as my, we like to call him my business partner, but I'm really the CEO founder, but yeah. I'd love to call him. I basically call him my right hand man in the video production aspect. Yeah. And I haven't taken a day where I'm like, Ooh, Spence isn't going to deliver. I've literally given him full reins being like, I have a video gig and they need a little bit of photo. So I need you to take on this part. So I take care of all the production. Yeah. And then I have him go in. And then by the end of the shoot, we've delivered everything. And the client just keeps coming back. Awesome. Mm -hmm. They're like, we need more video. We need some photo. We need more photo. We need a little bit of video. And I think that with Ripple being where they are now, it's been insane. Like it's an incredible business. I don't even personally think that I would be where I am now um, because I I think I always thought that I would just work for myself and I would never let anyone else into my business. Mm -hmm. And now being an entrepreneur where I'm like, okay, let's think about the future. Yeah. Like I want to retire one day Mm -hmm. and I want to have passive income one day. (laughs) And because as a freelancer, you don't have a pension, like you put your money aside and then that's your life savings. And then your first house that becomes your investment and your life savings. Your retirement plan is your home. Like Mm -hmm. it's not the same as everyone who's, you know, getting their tax deductions every two weeks and then they get their pension when they retire and whatever. Yeah. Like we have a lot of planning to run a business. And that's another thing in photography and Ripple alone. It's like, I'm not just taking photos and then invoicing a client. There's like continuous conversation with the client by emails, even if it's at 1030 at night or it's a 6 a.m. Or if I'm in a different country and I'm in a different time zone and they need something. Yeah. I'm up until I finish yeah. that job. Yeah. yeah. And like you said, When you enjoy your life, you work 24 hours a day when you enjoy your job. It is a thing. But I don't wake up on Mondays thinking, oh, fuck, I hate this week. I wake up every Monday. Well, I actually don't wake up every Monday thinking it's a great week because I don't even know what day it is every morning (laughs) because I work every day. But Monday's not much. (laughs) But I think for me, my life is just a cycle. Like every day I'm like, yo, all right, let's get this bread. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's my jam. And I think that's just where I've been since I also started the agency. I think that's where I have been now. So like my hustle mode is on another level. My sleep mode is definitely lacking, (laughs) but I also am very high functioning under pressure because of my past. Yeah. Working sports, school studies, whatever. So like, it's kind of human nature now that like, I don't think I do anything else, but be an entrepreneur for the rest of my life. I could never take on a nine to five. I also love being my own boss. Yeah. I get to wake up every day and make my own decisions. Yeah. And that's not something that everybody gets to say. Like a lot of people have to depend on their bosses to tell them, you know, what they're going to do or when they're, you know, going to get their next promotion. Yeah. And me, it's like, no. Hi. Nice to meet you guys all. I just wanted to let you know that this year my rate has gone up. And if you're comfortable hiring me for this project, I'm happy to assist. But if you're not, this is my rate. And if that person doesn't want to do it, someone else is going to come around. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. What am I worried about? That's good. Mm -hmm. That's a good place to be. Yeah. It's a very good place to be. So um, photos, video. Yeah. Where else do you see it? I dabble in other things that I... Going into. Yeah. So I have someone who's an incredible writer. Um, So I have her if we need any content creation in that sense or copywriting. 
Yeah. Someone's looking to build their website. So she'll build a questionnaire and she's actually a songwriter and a singer. So it's like really fluid how she functions. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so you can kind of tell like the way that she'll write about something is very, um, not sentimental, but everything that she writes has a purpose. Yeah. So that's meaningful. Cool. Maybe. Yeah. So I have a content writer. Um, I'm still dabbling along social content, like creation and management. It's very tricky because everyone wants social management for kind of cheap. Like yes. I hate to say oh, it. No, it, it's it's because I've, because everyone's like, well, it's easy to she, just open. She's not saying that in the context. No, no, not it's not surprised, <laughs> But I worked before I was. Um, working with Nelson and Hover, I was freelance and like yeah. people want so much and they don't want to pay, but also they don't understand how much work it is to post and do social media. But you know what? Anytime you tiptoe into creative, the amount of time you have to allocate really starts to creep and yeah. expand. Yeah. Because yeah. what you think is going to take you 20 minutes can easily be two hours. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's another thing too, right? Where people just look at things. Here's the thing. I think if Instagram actually costs something monthly to run, people would understand the cost it is to generate the content to run your page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because these are free things, people think that they can do it themselves for free. So why would they hire someone else? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like photos. It's like, well, it's my daughter's 16th, you know, quinceanera. So I'm just going to take the photos on my phone. Okay, that's fantastic. But do you want someone to give you the best memories of that quinceanera that's never going to happen again? Or do you want to do it on your phone? So people are like, well, I can take my own pictures. That's great. You do your own pictures, but you're never going to get them professionally with your iPhone. So it's the same thing with Instagram. It's like, well, I can manage my own page. That's great. You do that. But if you're an influencer and you're trying to market an item or look authentic about it, you might want to hire a professional that can make it look that way Mm -hmm. with it being professional that can get you a higher price point for your next job that can also be reutilized for the client's purpose. So being like a shampoo ad, like it's one thing if you're just holding a bottle and you're smiling and then you call it your campaign and you charge the client, but will that campaign want to reuse it? No. If you do something professional, will it look Look like a something they can put on their ad. Yes. Will they pay you more for that? Yes. So when people are like, I have some sponsorships, I need photographs. So just wondering what your day rate is. And I was like, no, 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 there's no day rate for a sponsorship. You're being paid individually for every job. So am I. Yeah. So that's the kind of way that I go into that too. Now I'm like, sometimes people just think that things can be cheaper because anyone can do it. Anyone's right. a photographer now. You can buy a camera anywhere, but yeah. do you have the skill to do the right job? No, maybe not. Maybe you do. But sometimes people look at our price points and they're like, whoa, this is really out of my budget. I'm like, hey, listen, I can offer you someone cheaper. But it's like, you don't pay me for my time. You pay me for my skills. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely. Totally. And is it really an event without a professional photographer? Yeah. No, it's like, not really. Is it really an event if there's not you like know. a paparazzi flash in your face? No. I love that. And you're like, not really. <laughs> Teary eyed. You know, it's like, like the mother wandering around with her iPhone taking pictures of everybody. It's like <laughs> a way, way less of a good, <laughs> a positive experience. Like I, but that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. We're seeing, um, uh, like on that note, like uh, I, I, something I saw on Instagram, but it's like, you know, you're not paying. I'm getting paid this price because I can do it in 30 minutes. Oh, it's that you know, song. Yes. It yeah. costs that much because it takes me fucking yeah. hours. Right. Yeah. No, but it's, and it's like it's, it's like I can do that job in 30 minutes and my rate is this because I've had this much experience. Yeah. Yeah. Like, sure, you can pay someone less and it'll take them six hours and it's going to be shittier. Yeah. And then you're going to come back. And when you come back, my rate's going to be even higher. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it also it, it um, you know, some people think that they're they should be charging by the hour. But what ends up happening is you, you accumulate all these skills and then you realize, oh, I could do this in half an hour. And yeah. I used yeah. to be able I used to do it in four hours. Yeah. You know? Like editing. So like for photo, for instance, everything that you kind of let's say an event, mm-hmm. you charge a rate hourly that should include your editing time. Mm-hmm. Um, but for, vo- for for video, it's things that I've learned through running Ripple is like I've learned so much from Spencer in the sense that he has a day rate for shooting. Mm-hmm. And then the client comes back and they're like, we need a 15 second edit. Mm-hmm. We need a one minute edit. Well, the way I look at that is like, 
a one minute can take him four hours. Oh yeah. So then we should be paying him a higher rate for the one hour, for the one minute than a 15 minute mm-hmm. or 15 second. Yeah. And sometimes people are just like, yeah, but like you're just putting things together. And and that's another thing I'm like, do you guys understand how much work is put into the, like when I'm, when I leave your event, I'm not done my job. Mm-hmm. Right. Like for every eight hours of being on set, there's probably four more that I have to put in in post. And that's me having to take a half day off of a different job to finish yours. Right. Yeah. I'll put it in the show notes and I'll send it to you. But it's an old, um, I think it's an old TED talk um, from uh, Creative Mornings and it's called Fuck You, Pay Me. Oh, and it's man. so it gotta is read so it or good. watch it's it, like, whatever it is. Yeah. So that concept has been I mean, a lot of people have riffed on that, but um, it was a talk that like really changed. It was in the early days of social media that I heard it. And he's like, you know, he kind of goes through a lot of the things we've talked about. And he's like, fuck you, pay me. Like, but you, you know, know what's it, really interesting about that, too, though, is that as artists and when you especially when you work for yourself, it's it's you almost don't want to ask for your money. Like, yeah, there's, it's like, there's a part of this weird mentality where we work for our money and then we're nervous to ask for it. Mm -hmm. Why, why are we that way? Like, I feel like if you guys Uh, talk to other individuals that are on that freelancing world, I feel like you should ask them. This should be an ongoing conversation because it's like, at what point, At what point is it uncomfortable to ask someone for money for the job you already did? Right. And you know what? The the thing about it that is also quite funny in a way is that the client respects you and respects your professionalism more if you're like, okay, pay me. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, like, uh, because because when it comes down to it, as especially in a a relationship with a photographer, I want to feel like I'm working with someone who's legit. Yeah. Like I'm getting like, this is a photographer. Yeah. Like I'm bringing in like Annie Leibovitz here. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> Annie Leibovitz isn't for waiting at too, 30. I've worked for Nelson and Nelson paid me the next day. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there we go. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> talk about people who respect other artists. There's, there's not many. Well, everyone respects the artist until then you realize that like you're not a priority in returning the favor at the end of the day. Yeah, totally. It's so rude. That really... That really grinds my gears. <laughs> I mean, listen, you could be working on a project with the corporate people, but if they get paid every two weeks, they really just don't understand where we are as yeah. artists. And I think that that in general, maybe I just opened a can of worms on social, but I think that needs to be a more open conversation yeah. with individuals who run their own world, their yeah. own business, their own life. Yeah. Why are they lagging 30 days, 60 days right. payment? Like, it's great if you have enough income that you can afford everything and whatever comes in is just like you're going to nudge them, but you're not desperate for the money. But artists are not all there. No. And everybody in living in Toronto is so expensive that people are not like people are living paycheck to paycheck. You could be the best photographer. You could have an incredible portfolio. But also, if you just don't know how to properly run your business and you're not being paid on time and whatever, you could also be struggling Yeah, in a different way. Yeah, you could have like... There's eight dollar coffees out there. Yeah, but you, <laughs> out there, yeah, everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> but you could have, you know, I when I was freelance for a long time, there were times, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's like I would have, you know, you you have thousands of dollars in outstanding invoices, and you still need to keep a roof over your head. And I mean, I would be going out to like events, have like all kinds of products and things and stuff, but you can't pay your rent or your mortgage with like boxes of goods and things. And people would send you stuff like I need checks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need checks. I need them to show up on time and I need to make sure that I can live. And like, you know, waiting on money from people when you've already done the job is just, it's so annoying. So in June alone, um, from customer, well, from, from my jobs and from freelancing and from hiring other people and sourcing out other jobs, um, in June alone, nobody paid on time in July. Not a single person paid on time in July. And there was $65,000 in the business that was overdue. Right. Just And that's contractors on. that I have to pay. Yeah. So guess who, who pays on time, who right. has to then put my money aside so that I can pay everybody else and I can't pay myself. Yeah. Right. Every get everybody gets paid. Everybody gets you paid wait on my on, team. On the clients. Everybody gets paid on my team. But yeah, but you're waiting on the client. Yeah. <laughs> me. 
Yeah. How do you run a business when everyone else on your team gets paid but you? Yeah. I like, guess that's not a and profitable business. And and then you're basically chasing after people. Yep. Yeah. But, you know, when you have a really close relationship too with your co like with your freelancers and stuff, you're like, hey, listen, I already know this client's not paying us for 90 days. So um, let's say that it's like a five thousand dollar budget that I'm paying someone. I'm like, let me cover fifty percent. Yeah. For now. Let me pay you a deposit literally the day that you're on job. I'll give you a deposit and then go. Yeah. But also like Spencer, for instance, I have had him in my team for so long. I'll be like, hey, listen, they don't pay. You and I both don't get paid. Do you want to take on the job? And then we're going to have to wait 120 days. He's like, yeah, it's totally fine. Because I hire the guy four days a week. Right. Like we're that busy that I hire Mm. him four days a week. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. So as I like the retirement plan is the <laughs> passive income on that side, it's creating an agency at some point where I'm going to have to start looking at people that are younger than me, obviously, because mm-hmm. we can't all be in our thirties right now and then all want to retire at the same time. And then business just never exists. <laughs> but, um, there's like things I dabble in. I, I was just talking about it with uh, Spencer actually. And coming here, I was like, what if I did a podcast or what if I did sessions, virtual sessions or online classes Absolutely. Um, that could bring in super easy passive income. And then he was like, with what time? <laughs> right. And I was like, You're okay, fair. Add day to the week. I was like, fair. There's only seven days and I work seven days. So I'll do it at night. And he was like, well, you edited who will join your sessions? <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah. right. No one will, but you could make a course that people could mm-hmm. yeah, like a register. Class yeah. People, so you don't have to do them all the time. That way you yeah. can package it. And but sell that's it. the thing. There's some really genius guys out there, girls as well. But there's yeah. a guy that recently, one of my friends did a $35 three hour session yeah. and a one hour Q and a, and he's a photographer and he's from the States. <laughs> and he did a session about retainers and how to run your business. Mm. The guy did three hours and with a one hour Q and a on a, what are we today? We're, mm, I was going to say Monday. What day are we? Tuesday. Okay. No, it's Wednesday? Thursday. Oh shit. Okay. The other T day. Yeah. So he <laughs> did a session, I think two days ago for three hours and he charged $35 a head and 218 people attended. Oh. Yeah. Fantastic. So the guy made 7,500 bucks. Yeah. Right. Talking for three hours and letting an hour to 218 people just ask a question. Yeah. Oh. Fantastic. I should well, do if, a second. Yeah. You're like, <laughs> so, yeah. dang, no, $35, self. three hours, <laughs> one hour Q and a that's 10, that's $12, not even $12 an hour for someone to get incredible education. If it's useful for you to use this space, it's here. Hey, listen, you want it. we'll always uh, throw a good little hover yeah <laughs> hover moment yeah but um yeah so there's like the goal is to sit back and relax someday but i'm such a workaholic i'll probably do this for the next 30 years mm-hmm. no i won't be doing events for very much like for much longer i think it's just catching up to me mm-hmm. um but everything else is the plan yeah well the that's ex- fantastic the expansion of it well, we wish you incredible success. Mm, with thank Ripple you. Media Group. Yeah. And you're doing. And I'm so happy that you guys are also so close in my life that you got to see the progress of us. Yeah. Too. yeah. Us too. It was really exciting to see the post. Yeah. I was super pumped. I bet you were. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank on you. Cast of Creators. You're definitely a wonderful creator. In Thanks. Minds. Always happy to and come back. Yeah. On serious, more serious topics. Always come happy to come back. <laughs> <laughs> We can have a whole um, net 30 session. I was where we say, talk we about do payment. have so many stations. We, we should have a round table about We should do a round paid. table. Like we should do like a uh, influencer, entrepreneur, uh, a salesperson, yeah, uh, artist. Let's like, do one. You know? I'm down. I'd like I'd Great. that a lot. To the next time. Just send me a thing. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> we will. Thank Pleasure. you so much Thank for you. joining Thank us today. Thank you so much today. for having me. So much fun. So fun. Thank you for watching and listening. You can find eFancy at ElaineFancy.com. And watch previous episodes of Cast of Creators on YouTube, your favorite podcast platform, or visit castofcreators.com for show notes and info. And don't forget to subscribe.